Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. So ransomware is not going away. And I know that everyone's probably tired of hearing about ransomware, but I read an article recently that advocated for planning for a ransomware attack. And I thought it was a good topic to talk about because they phrased it in a way that resonated with me. And the point of the article was that you're going to be the victim of ransomware attack. We always say that kind of almost nonchalantly these days as like a punchline. It's not if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen. You know, zero trust, someone in the network already, that type of rhetoric. Assume breach. Assume breach, exactly. And so we all say that, but do we really, really prepare for it? Because organizations are dedicating a massive amount of time to trying to prevent ransomware from happening, but it's still happening. And that, in part, is due to just the cyber criminals having an asymmetric advantage and substantial financial incentives to mount these attacks. And it's going to continue to rise because attack vectors are changing. Defense is always harder. There's no tool that can be 100% effective against phishing or hijacked websites, infected supply chains, even profit sharing among disgruntled employees, which is a new thing where ransomware gangs are reaching out to employees and saying, Hey, if you don't like your company, let me pay you some money so you can drop this USB in there and we'll pay you. So it is a, almost a losing game, like a -a whack-a-mole. So really what, we as defenders need to focus on is making that attack much less potent when it happens. And so you want to plan for the worst. And if you plan for the worst, you can make the worst less bad. And so this article talked about planning for attacks in three different buckets, training technology and risk management. In the training part of it, I really enjoyed the analogy because they talked about aviation. And I come from a military background. I was an aviator in the Air Force. And when we flew, we always planned for emergencies. Aviation in general, both civilian and military, they prioritize safety And they plan for emergencies. And this has paid off over the years because the ratio of accidents per million flights has decreased from 6.3 in 1970 to only 0.51 in 2019. And this was achieved through a bunch of different training and technology and risk management and just mainly reducing the amount of mishaps that are happening. Pilots not only have checklists to make sure, but they plan and practice every time when there's something that happens. So these checklists plan for every single thing. And just as an example, I pulled up the flight manual for a Cessna 152. And just looking through the emergency procedures for a 152, there's a bunch of them. Engine failure, while you're on the ground, engine fire when you're on the ground, engine failure immediately after takeoff, engine failure during flight. And so when I pull up one of these, if I were to have an engine failure in flight, it tells me exactly what I need to check. First thing, check my airspeed. It needs to be at 60 knots. The carburetor heat, it needs to be turned on. The primer it needs to be in. The fuel valve needs to be on. So it goes down this checklist, and that's what you do. You look at each checklist, you flip the switch. And when we used to fly, we used to do something called chair flying, which was literally sitting in a chair, not in the cockpit, but someone would say, okay, you have an engine failure in flight. What do you do? 
I physically take out my checklist. I go through the checklist. I visualize where that switch is on the panel and I imaginary flip it. And you walk through the emergency, look out the window, look for a soft place to land, stuff like that. And you practice them over and over and over again because you don't want the first time when you're in the air and something bad happens for you to look at this checklist for the first time and have to look for the switch, right? You want to know where that thing is because you visualized it. You have the drawing of the cockpit and you know exactly where the switch is and you're going to flip it for real this time. So that is an analogy directly related to cybersecurity ransomware attacks because you need to have a plan. You need to plan for the worst. And not only that, you need to walk through it. You need to practice it. You need to simulate it. You need to shut you know, your company or some key stakeholders down for four hours once a year or something like that and table walk the worst case scenario, who you're going to call, what processes you're going to set up, what are the key apps that you need that are business critical that you need to bring up first and how are you going to recover devices? Like those are all things that you need to think about and walk through and have a plan to do it because you don't want to be flying by the seat of your pants, no pun intended to during a ransomware attack. You want to have that plan in place and have it practiced. So, you know, okay, we're going to call legal. We're going to call finance. We're going to call, our public affairs person, our marketing person to put out a statement. You know, those are all things that you should have practiced beforehand and know exactly what you're going to do. So we did a show a while back now where we talked about some of the, the things you're going to want after an attack potentially happens that you might not have thought about. And we went through talking about how, for example, you might need somebody who is a negotiator and can negotiate with the ransomware team. You might need to have a Bitcoin wallet ready to go. So you don't have to go through that whole process of spinning one up to pay a ransom. If you're going to use your cyber insurance or whatever. So that show was more focused on what are some of the things you might not think about when you're responding. But what Andy's getting at today is the actual process of preparing to respond of practicing your response ahead of time. And I, as he was walking through this in pre-show to me, I thought the, the aviation analogy could not be more perfect because when you're sitting on an aircraft and, and if anything goes wrong, you want to know when you're sitting in that seat that the pilot has practiced what to do in every scenario, not just as pulling a checklist off the shelf and is going through it for the first time and seeing it for the first time, but they've practiced it in the simulator or heaven forbid in reality, but that's not their first time seeing it. You want that feeling, right? Well, don't you want that same feeling for your organization? And it might not be practical to pull everybody out of the office for a day and go through this, but there are still ways you can get some sort of practice in place and be prepared to respond. And, and I also thought Andy kind of your, your monologue at the top of the show was perfect in the sense of, we all say these things as lip service, assume breach, um, assume there's a persistent threat in your network. Um, it's not if, but when we say all those things, but we're not really living it. As I see the majority of my customers are still so incredibly focused on prevention and protection. And when they do inevitably have an attack, it's not like everybody's calm and cool and knows exactly what to do and, you know, what to, what to follow in the checklist. They're, they're running around, you know, in the fog of war, in the heat of the moment, trying to figure out their next steps. And then they're learning that some of their plans uh, aren't, aren't possible to implement because they didn't think through all the contingencies. And those things would have come out if you had practiced them in depth. So I thought this conversation is, is really topical as the threat of ransomware only grows and organizations need to continue to evolve their response to it. One of my favorite movies is Sully. And that is about 
the captain who landed his plane in the Hudson River. And if you watch it, he had a double engine flame out at like 2,500 feet, which has never happened with like over 100 people on board. And if you watch through that movie or listen to the black box recorder, they are extremely calm throughout the entire thing. They walk through their checklist, they go through their contingency plans, and then they make the decision in less than two minutes to land in the Hudson River. And that's how you should be under a ransomware attack. Like Adam said, when it happens, you can see the stress on people's faces. If you walk into the office, you can feel it. People are legitimately kind of running around with their head on fire. And if you were to practice and go through the steps, you can respond in a calm manner. You'll have your processes lined up and you've done it kind of like a fire drill, kind of like an active shooter drill. I mean, those are all stressful situations, but unfortunately there are emergencies that we have to practice and you have to be able to respond calmly in them. People practice fire drills all the time, you know, and if there was a real fire, most people actually would evacuate a building calmly and in a single file line just like they practice. You wouldn't see people just trampling and running over people. So I think this is one of the biggest things that cybersecurity defenders can do for their company is to draft of a plan and then practice it. Advocate for practicing it because it will pay off dividends. The next point that they had was to try to add some resiliency. So once you have a plan try to add some resiliency to that plan because if your plan is like, we're going to manually re-image every machine our employees have at home and we're not going to let everyone connect until it's done. Like that's not going to really work in practice. That might be like your, you know, last resort scorched earth type response, but you want to try to have some sort of tools in place that you know that you could try to recover these machines with while being remote as well without having to just go scorched earth and just re-image everything. And in the article, it actually talked about having some persistent resilient tools that can automatically reinstall themselves from the PC BIOS even after the entire disk had been wiped. I don't know of a tool like that. If you do know of a tool like that for Windows machines, I'd like to know. So send us the message because that would be pretty cool. Uh, I've never even seen anything like that in practice. Adam, I I know you said that maybe Macs have some sort of way of doing this, but I don't know of any way for Windows to do this without maybe a third-party tool. But yeah, that's, that's what the article advocates for is just having a way to persist and be resilient without just having to go scorched earth. Yeah. So we, we had this discussion in the pre-show and I was mentioning that on a Macintosh, all modern Macs have the ability to recover a fresh operating system image using what's called internet recovery. And that's actually baked into the firmware of the Mac. So you can hold down the magic key command, which I actually don't know what it is off the top of my head. I think it's something like command option IR or something. I don't know. Don't quote me. But when you do that magic invocation, it will boot up in firmware. So that's not on the disk, but actually in firmware and either connect to Ethernet if it's available or ask you for a Wi-Fi network and connect to it. And once it does that, it will actually download a small Mac OS image that can be used to recover the system or reinstall the system. So truly from firmware, you can get all the way back to a healthy image. Now, if you combine that with something like uh, Apple Business Manager and Device Enrollment Program, you could literally take that Mac all the way back to being under a managed state with all the policies and apps and everything it needs without ever touching it. And so I think they're advocating for something similar to the PC, but I don't know if you necessarily have to go all the way, like nuke the disk from orbit kind of thing. Certainly with autopilot, I forget which specific um, capability of autopilot it is. Andy, I think you said fast start or fresh start or something like that. Fresh start. Fresh start. That's something you can invoke 
um, literally from the, the Microsoft Endpoint Manager dashboard, and it will trigger the device to essentially not wipe itself all the way, but reset enough of the files. It's kind of like the reset your PC option, if you've ever done that on Windows, and bring it back to a state when you're going to configure it essentially starting over. And that would probably be sufficient in most cyber attacks to be pretty confident you've wiped out any attack. And again, if you've done all your homework and got an autopilot set up and Azure AD join and all these modern technologies, you could then re-image that, not re-image, but rebuild that PC without ever touching it. The user signs in, they get all their policies, they get all their apps, they get everything they need, and they can go be productive and you don't have to bring them all inside the office building and re-image them on the bench one at a time, right? You can do it at scale remotely. And I think that's what it's, what it's getting at here. Um, it would be even cooler if you had something in BIOS and, and this is really up to the individual PC maker OEMs. So like Dell and HP and Lenovo, that if their firmware had the ability to do the same thing, Apple's does where it can download some sort of like you know, essentially the windows 10 or windows 11 installer and install itself. And, and that's really on the OEMs more than on a Microsoft thing, but that would be cool too, to have kind of equivalent capability with Apple there. But again, I don't think necessarily you need to nuke the disc from orbit. If you completely blow away the OS and reconfigure it, that should be good for all, but the most sophisticated ransomware attacks. And before we go to the third one, all of these things that we're talking about today, one very, very important point is that they all have to be done in advance. Like you can't have these tools installed on the fly while there's a ransomware attack going on, right? You need to be able to have autopilot configured or you need to be able to have, well, for Apple, of course, they already have that built in, but for Windows, you probably need to have some sort of tool in order to do this. You're going to need to have that installed and you're going to need to have that prepared and prepped, which means you need to think about if ransomware were to hit from a remote user or from within our company, like how am I going to stop that attack? And then how am I going to recover those devices? What's my plan to recover those devices? Just like building a plan and training, like you're going to need to practice that. And so this third one is risk management, right? And that's, we've talked about risk management before. There's entire books written on cybersecurity risk management, but again, risk management can't be done while there's a ransomware attack going on. It has to be done in advance. And that's what the zero trust architecture, even though it's a buzzword, is all about. It's that we don't implicitly trust anything that is touching our networks because we expect that one of them will be compromised. And instead of focusing on the chances that it'll happen, we focus on the chances that that infection will propagate to another machine or become a problem. So you need to be able to have that plan to have that risk management part and try to minimize that. So that's what this conversation all is about is stop focusing on all the tools. The tools are great, but in reality, you got to have a plan. Like honestly, like I think this is something that a lot of companies do not have. And if you have it, I guarantee you that even less of them practice it. So I thought that this was a great topic to talk about because you need to identify, understand your key risks, identify your major critical corporate applications, have a plan to recover them and make some strategic decisions to minimize the risk and train the team. That way, when you're a victim, you're going to be able to minimize how long you're a victim for. And that's really the key. It's a, it's a shift in kind of a mindset because I think for years, cybersecurity defenders are just all about trying to prevent the attack from happening. And honestly, I don't think if you're targeted that you're going to be able to prevent it, really. It's really just about how long... You're going to be down for and what your plan is to recover. I was just explaining to someone today that mindset shift in cybersecurity that is ongoing in that to use the very tired analogy of the moat and castle, 
and how it used to be that we're not going to allow them to breach the castle walls because that moat's going to prevent them from getting close. You know, now we think of like reducing the blast radius, reducing the amount of impact it can have. So you may have scaled the first castle wall, but aha, there's an internal wall that's going to stop you from moving much further. And so even though you breach the outer defenses, you haven't breached the inner defenses. And um, obviously that's a a tired analogy, but it still holds true in that if you have a plan, just because a bunch of files got encrypted, it doesn't have to be the end of the world necessarily either. Um, Your inner defenses still stood stout. And I thought probably the most impactful part of this conversation, Andy, was when you were talking about it's great to practice a plan, but that plan, if it's, you know, quote, we will manually reimage every machine our employees have at home and we won't let anyone connect till it's done. Like that's the other valuable part of this process is not only the practice part of it, but recognizing like, if you, if you try to practice that, you're going to be like, this stinks, let's find something better. And, and that's kind of the whole point here. And, and I note how, in a, in a previous show, when we were talking about um, the, that pen testing group that had found they could sniff TPM decryption keys over the bus, and these conversations always come back up, and it's amazing how often they come back up. Again, it's not all about prevention, but it is amazing how if you, if you invest in some of the right technologies in advance, like modern endpoint management, like zero trust network architecture how much easier they're going to make your life in responding to this too. They are not the end all be all. They do not completely eliminate the risk of ransomware and modern endpoint management, especially probably doesn't do a whole lot to eliminate the risk, but it does help you deal with the aftermath of it. If you have a very modern endpoint management strategy in place that allows you to respond at scale without touching devices, you're going to be in a better position than having to bring them all in and stack them up on the bench. Right. And so I I think going through this process again, is going to highlight the need to invest in the fundamentals and make sure the fundamentals are sound and reevaluating and reassessing some of our assumptions we've made in the past that this is good enough. This is not a need right now because in the aftermath of an attack, you're going to realize, man, it would be really great if we had this. And if you practice that plan and you build that plan and you plan for resiliency, you're going to, you're going to learn just how important those are. So I thought great conversation on this subject tonight, Andy. Yeah. And just one final thing, because you kind of sparked this thought in my head as you were talking about that is that it's really hard to know how good your plan is if you don't practice it. But not only that, when you actually walk through your plan, there may be little nuances that you didn't think about that as you're walking through the plan, you make adjustments to. Like in the case of doing an exercise, maybe you have a tool that's installed that you can remotely wipe a machine. You don't have to wipe like 100 machines, like maybe in a real world crisis, but maybe you try wiping the one machine and you discover that, oh, it's super slow or it had problems connecting, or when I re-imaged it, it didn't, you know, it got corrupted or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. There'll be nuances that you'll discover as you're walking through the plan and re-imaging one machine is a good test. And so we do that stuff all the time in IT where we do a POC of some sort, right? And so this would be kind of POCing your plan, right? <laughs> um, and you'll discover things uh, because you always do in IT. And you don't want to discover that the image is going to become corrupted or that you're doing it over a slow internet connection or whatever during a cyber attack, right? Like practicing that plan and finding out during when your engine is on fire in the air is not the right time to discover that. So, you know, again, have a plan and, and walk through it, practice it. The, the most impactful thing you just said there, and I, I already used that phrase, but I'm going to replace my most impactful. That POC analogy is so good because one of the things as a seller that always strikes me as not that you shouldn't do it, but it's, it always has felt weird to me because it's felt like duplication of effort is let's say you have a product that literally millions and millions and millions of people use. We'll say Azure Active Directory. It's a great product. Gartner loves it. Forrester loves it. Everyone recognizes it's really good at what it does. If, if a company is using a competitive product, 
they're still going to put it through its paces in their environment. They're still going to validate it meets all of their needs and all of their use cases. And it's, why don't you just take the word of the tens of millions of people that use Azure AD every day? Well, we need to test it for ourselves in our environment, right? Okay. I've always thought, man, that's kind of duplicative. I mean, can't we just trust at a certain point? Like clearly this is pretty good, but then people don't test this in their environment. They don't test this plan in their environment and what's specific to them. They just go, Oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll just go with whatever, you know, our IR team tells us to do or whatever, like what, like test it in your environment. You test everything you buy, you know, religiously before you buy it. Why aren't you testing your recovery plan too? That's specific to you and making sure that it works the way you intend. So that I thought that POC analogy is really good. You're doing a POC of your, your resiliency and recovery efforts. Exactly. Well, great conversation, Adam. Hopefully our listeners took away some key points as I did from this and we'll continue to have good conversations going forward. Hopefully that's our show for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have questions about the show or you want to suggest some topics for us to talk about, talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.